In this video, we're going to look at Huckel theory and how it can be used to estimate the energies of the pi orbitals in planar hydrocarbons. So I've got my molecule C2H4 right here, ethene or ethylene, depending on uh, the age of your organic chemistry professor. And this is planar, so all of the atoms lie in a single plane. And the only orbitals that come up out of that plane, as I've defined it here to be the, the plus z axis is the normal vector away from the plane, is the pz orbitals from the carbon, which come out of the plane there. So 2pz1 and 2pz2, if I call these carbon 1 and carbon 2, respectively. Okay, so what does... What does this imply for the pi system of, of such a molecule? Well, first of all, the first thing to notice about pi bonds is that pi bonds tend to have a weaker overlap than sigma bonds. So since pi bonds have a weaker overlap, therefore they have a smaller disturbance away from their reference energy in their non-interacting state. So the energy of pi orbitals in a pi bond is usually quite small relative to uh, the change in energy in sigma bonds. So for example, this carbon-carbon single bond will have a much greater change in energy down to a lower energy than this carbon-carbon pi bond. And same thing for all the, all the CH sigma bonds here as well. So that means that the pi orbitals are kind of in, alone by themselves. They kind of form their own subsystem within the molecule, where you can almost treat them as not interacting with the rest of the molecule. <clears throat> and the thing that really helps out for the rest of this, for planar hydrocarbons in particular, is that the overlap integral of that 2pz orbital with any other orbital in the molecule that isn't another 2pz orbital is going to equal zero. So not only are they have, do they have weak overlap and there's a small change in energy, but if the molecule is actually planar, then there is literally no overlap between uh, this and all the other s orbitals, between it and the px and the py orbitals. So they kind of form their own little world here in the, in the pi system. So we can treat our pi orbitals as kind of forming their own system. So you have psi pi, wave function of the pi orbitals is going to be C1 2pz of C1 plus C2 2pz of C2. Okay, so now what we want to do, we want to solve for uh, the energies and the coefficients of these particular wave functions. So one way to do that when we don't uh, know the analytical solution to a problem is we can solve it by the linear variational method with the secular determinant. So if I start drawing that out for this system, H11 minus ES11, Hamiltonian matrix element 1, 1 minus the energy of the orbital times the overlap of 1 and 1, H21 minus ES21, H12 minus ES12, H22 minus ES22, all of that forming a determinant equals zero. And if you're unfamiliar with this type of expression, just go and search the, the videos on linear variational method and secular determinant, and it'll pop right up. Okay, so for our case, we're going to simplify this by assuming that Sij is the Kronecker delta, delta Ij, saying that the basis set is orthonormal. So our diagonal elements, Sii, for 1, 1, and 2, 2, that's going to be 1. And S for I not equals J is going to be 0. Okay, so that simplifies things quite a bit. 
we can get it down to H11 minus E H21 H12 and H22 minus E. And that determinant equals zero. Okay, so that's nothing, we've specified nothing thus far that implies Huckle theory, but we've gotten our secular determinant down to this form. So now the approximation that means Huck, that is what Huckle theory is, is to define what these H elements are, what this Hamiltonian matrix is. So in Huckle theory, what we're going to do is we're going to say that H I J equals, and there's going to be one of three possibilities. We're going to have it be the parameter alpha if I equals J. It's going to be the parameter beta if I and J are adjacent carbon atoms, and it's going to be zero otherwise if they are non-adjacent and not the same. Okay, so let's apply this to our matrix here, see what we get. So in this case, H11, I equals J, that's alpha, so I have alpha minus E. If they're adjacent, H1, H12, one and two are adjacent to one another on the, on the chain, so that gives us beta. Same thing for H12, H22 is also alpha, because it is I and J are the same, minus E equals zero. Okay, now that's pretty simple. Alpha and beta are just parameters, so we have to solve E in terms of alpha and beta. So let's just go ahead and do that. So solving a two by two determinant, this times this minus that times that equals zero. So I have alpha minus E squared minus beta squared equals zero. I can expand that out into a uh, second order polynomial. When I finish out expanding that and combining all the terms, what I get is one e squared plus minus two alpha e times, sorry, minus two alpha times E plus alpha squared minus beta squared equals zero. Okay, so that's A, B, and C. Solve the quadratic formula for A, B, and C, and I promise you if you do that correctly, what you end up getting solving that quadratic formula is that E equals alpha plus or minus beta. Okay, so what does this result mean? How do we interpret this? So the alpha is just going to define the zero of energy. So alpha kind of gives us a reference point because what, what is alpha? So alpha is a Hamiltonian matrix element if I equals J. So that's H11. So even if the molecule were completely non-interacting, even if the molecule were separate, even if this were a carbon atom on its own, it would be it would still be alpha. So alpha is just the energy of the p orbital by itself. So that and we're always going to have to subtract out the energy of that relative to, you know, that has to be the reference state is the is the p orbital by itself. So that kind of gives us a scale to defining the zero of energy. And beta is a scale for the orbital energies, telling us we can measure these orbital energies relative to the value beta. So let's plot this in an orbital diagram. So what we have is we have some orbital, orbital, they come together, they form a bonding orbital and an anti-bonding orbital. So we have PZ1, PZ2, 
pi bonding. Let me call this bonding, anti-bonding. <clears throat> okay, and what are the energies of this graph? So the energy of a p orbital by itself is alpha. Then the lower energy is alpha plus beta. And the higher energy is alpha minus beta. And beta has been determined empirically. Of course, this is an approximation, so it's going to be an approximate value. But the empirical value of beta has been determined through uh, various experiments to be about minus 75 kilojoules per mole. So the energy of this pi bond in ethylene is about 75 kilojoules per mole because its energy relative to the reference state is it is one beta of energy lower than the reference, giving us a pi orbital energy of about 75 kilojoules per mole. Now this doesn't seem particularly helpful on its own, given that we could just use the energy of the pi orbital in ethylene to define beta. But where this is going to start becoming uh, helpful and useful to us is in more, uh, more elaborate pi systems and to help us gain some insights into the properties of pi systems by use of this Huckel theory and these very simple approximations for these Hamiltonian matrix elements.